LSU starts off its, its series against Arkansas with a loss 7-4 to four on Thursday night. And while the home plate officiating absolutely did not help LSU in the slightest, the relief pitching didn't do themselves any favors either. You are Locked On LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's up, y'all? Welcome into Locked On LSU. Thanks for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, and you can also check us out on YouTube as well. So just search Locked On LSU in that search bar. Hit the subscribe button, and then you'll get notified as soon as new episodes of the podcast drop. Today's edition of Locked On LSU is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. All right, let's get into it here on a good Friday. Happy Easter weekend. Um, LSU, Thursday, Friday, Saturday series with Arkansas in Fayetteville. First game last night, Jay Johnson decided to leave Luke Coleman in that Friday slot despite the Thursday, Friday, Saturday earlier adjusted schedule this weekend. Now, Jay Johnson did say he referenced, look, you know, he, he pitched a lot against Florida last week that right now, you know, he just wanted to give Luke Coleman full rest, give him a full week. Was that ultimately the decision that led Jay Johnson to start Luke Coleman on Friday Was it kind of, you know, waving the white flag a little bit and saying, look, we're going to go ahead and, you know, concede on Thursday. We'll move our ace, Luke Coleman, to Friday. So he isn't going up against Arkansas's ace, Hagan Smith, who I believe is the best, if not one of the best, but I'll say the best pitcher in the SEC. I don't know. I'll take his word for it. It makes sense, right? You know, Luke Coleman went, you know, he pitched a lot. We've pitched over 100 pitches against Florida. So I understand giving him the full week of rest. And also doesn't hurt that you now get Luke Holman on Friday night in game two against Arkansas. But LSU drops this one seven to four. And truly, I don't think that the final score was indicative of Arkansas with a three run victory. I don't think that was really indicative truly of of how the game went. It was really neck and neck until a three run bomb given up by Gavin Guidry at the bottom of the eighth. Just, it just blew it wide open and the game effectively ended there, but it was very back and forth and rather low scoring really for a majority of the game. There was some good, there was some bad, there was some ugly, there was some all of the above with LSU on Thursday night in Fayetteville. Overall, first, first and foremost, let me just say, I'm not the kind of person that likes to blame the referees. Like, I will call out poor officiating whenever I see it, whether it's umpires in baseball, refs in a basketball or a football game, judging in gymnastics, like whatever it might be. Like, I'll call it out when I feel like it was a bad call, but I think that 99.9% of the time, even when there's a bad call or poor officiating, there's about a, a laundry list of reasons why, other reasons why, that team may have lost that game, that it was, didn't just come down to one call, that it was, okay, yeah, you know, maybe it was a bad holding call here and there, but you still turn the ball over three times. You get what I mean? So I don't love to blame officiating on losses, and I'm not going to do that here, but I will say, did anyone else get as frustrated with the home plate officiating as I did last night? Like, I have no idea what that strike zone was throughout the entirety of the game. And it wasn't even just, oh, you know, first inning, you called this a strike, and then sixth inning, you called this a strike. No, no, no. It was like back-to-back pitches. The exact same pitch that ended up in the exact same spot. One could have been called a a ball. One could have been called a strike. The strike zone for an, an inning was either massive, and then the next inning, it automatically just shrunk like a foot. It felt like the home but home plate officiating was getting totally bamboozled by the catcher's framing. And let me just say, it was for both sides. Like LSU received some help 
but I think it was more egregious on the other side. Like some balls called strikes that I'm like, are, are you watching what I'm watching? What's the strike zone, dude? If you want a wide strike zone, that's fine. If you want an itty bitty baby strike zone, that's fine. At least be consistent. It was inconsistent home plate officiating all night long. I, at some point, I just had to throw my hands up and say, like, what? seriously? Like, really? Really? That's what we're going to call a strike of all things. That You're going to call that a strike? I don't even think that ball was hittable. So that was really frustrating last night. But there are still areas in which LSU is deficient that I can say those were the reasons why you lost. And the home plate officiating didn't help. Absolutely. That was frustrating. That's the kind of thing that I'm I'm ready to get out of the game. Like, I, like, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see a game, a series come down to a total BS call at the plate. But I'll give credit for LSU some good things that they did. First and foremost, the, the offense could have been better. Could have been better. But you at least saw some action at the plate, most notably from Tommy White and Hayden Travinsky. Back-to-back home runs. Tommy White hits a dinger. Very next pitch, Hayden Travinsky comes up to bat. He hits one out of the park as well. I think that's going to be kind of the theme for this team, at least for right now, if not for the entirety of the season. If no one else got you, Tommy White and Hayden Travinsky, they got you. That's Those are going to be your sluggers and your offense creators. But let's get to the bad offensively. 17 strikeouts for Arkansas. You struck out 17 times. And I know it was Hagen Smith. I just called him the best pitcher in the SEC. Newsflash, there's a lot of really good pitching in the SEC, and he's probably the best. I don't think any of us expected LSU to come out scot-free or without a little bit of frustration from the pitches that Hagen Smith was going to deal you. But 17 strikes, that's bad. Even with a terrible strike zone. Because I'll be the first one to admit, that strike zone was horrendous. You left too many, too many runners in scoring position. Far too many runners in scoring position. You're just looking at strikes. Times when LSU found themselves getting back in the game, or at least you saw... LSU with the ability to just to, you know, blow the door right open. And you looked at a ball that went right down the middle of the plate. I understand the apprehension because, again, I don't know what was a ball and what was a strike in those in that game last night. But you got to swing the bat and you got to have better judgment at the plate. That wasn't great. Pitching also wasn't great either. I'll go back to this was the uh, the round robin tournament in Houston. Uh, Jay Johnson said, "Look, we're we're going to be as good as our relief pitching is. It's not about the starting pitching, as important as that is. It's about our bullpen. Unfortunately, we're seeing the wrong side of that. We saw the wrong side of that when you blew a lead against Mississippi State when you." blew a lead against Florida on Saturday. And we saw that again last night. Javen Coleman gets the start again. Luke Coleman will get the start tonight on Friday. Fidel Uyoa comes in in relief of Javen Coleman. Really, for a majority of the season, has been fairly nails. But now that you've gotten into conference play, Fidel Uyoa has left me wondering, like, where was Where's the guy? Where's the pitcher that we saw before? He gives up two runs. Christian Little comes in. He gives up three hits. Now, Cam Johnson, to his credit, he came in with the bases loaded and he escaped without giving up a single run. But there were far too many walks. You struck out 10. You walked 11. Gavin Guidry gives up the three-run dinger. The game's over. Overall, you weren't good enough at the plate. You weren't good enough on the mound. Strike zone didn't help, but you weren't good enough last night. How worried are we? How concerned should we be about this team now that LSU has opened up conference play 2-5? and five? I talked with a former LSU Tiger. He gave in his insight 
to this team. Is he worried? We'll get into that coming up next after just a few words from our sponsors. All right, I want to tell you about our friends over at Manscaped. So this episode is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure the man in your life grooms his carpets and his drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Have him clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawn Mower 5.0 and watch his confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and have him join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code locked on for 20% off and for free shipping. So it also features dual LED spotlights to guide him through the darkest winter debris. So navigate with confidence in your delicate areas. Also, I do have to say, I, I live with a man, and he shaves everywhere. And I'm sick and tired of seeing a hair in the sink. But Manscaped is waterproof, so he can use it in the shower. Just wash it wash it down the drain. Sick of seeing the, the hair in the bathroom. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off of and. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on, L O C K E D O N, at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in his pants, ladies. All right, I want to tell you about Better Together. Is your bracket busted, but you still want to stay in the game? Let's be honest, everyone's brackets are busted, but it's the best time of the year in March Madness. So introducing to you Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. All you have to do is pick more or less on real-time player stats. You can strategize with your partner to boost your odds and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Better Together is the first cooperative daily fantasy application. Better Together makes you realize that daily fantasy sports is it's fun alone. Absolutely. But like a lot of things, it's better with friends. So download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Play with me at a contest on Saturday and remember the code Locked On, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. All right, rolling along here, Locked On LSU. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, we're part of the Locked On Network, your team, every single day. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your on your TV all day? I mean, hey, we're all guilty of it. We're all sports fans. But I find myself, sometimes I have to turn the volume down with all of that shouting. So make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every single day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. All right, rolling along here, Locked On LSU. LSU falls to Arkansas 7-4 LSU starts SEC play two in five. You lost the Mississippi State series. You lose the Florida series. Now down 0 in one at the beginning of the Arkansas series. Not ideal. It's not ideal in the slightest. It's not how I expected this team. I actually picked LSU to sweep Mississippi State in the first series. I, I predicted that LSU would beat Florida in two out of three games last week. And look, they were kind of, they were close to doing that. If it, you know, if, it's just not a wild pitch if you can just hold on to the ball in the bottom of the eighth on Saturday against Florida. Probably would have won that game. And then that run rule on Sunday would be at least a little bit more palatable because you at least won the series. You've yet to win a series in conference play. I expected this team to be better than that, even keeping in mind how much they lost this past season. So are you pressing the panic button? How worried are we? I talked to a former LSU Tiger, 
and asked him that question. Is he worried about this LSU team? I caught up with Kramer Robertson, of course, part of that 2017 College World Series Omaha final team. I asked him, is he worried? Is Kramer Robertson worried about this LSU baseball team? This is what he had to say. You know, LSU comes off the College World Series win last year. You don't lose Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz and get better. Uh, but, uh, of course, LSU comes in with a lot of hype, a preseason top 10 team. They start SEC play 2-5 and five with a loss against Arkansas last night. From your experience, we know that this conference is difficult. It's the most competitive conference in all of college baseball. But how do you turn your season around from where you are right now, maybe trying to fill in some roster holes, trying to figure out what you do best to ultimately get back to where I know this team wants to be, which is in Omaha this season? Yeah, I mean, people have to understand, and uh, and no LSU fan wants to hear this because you know how LSU baseball fans are. But they definitely they didn't got a target on their back. They won the national championship. Like this is inevitable. It's going to happen. There's going to be struggle. There's going. To, you're getting everybody's best shot. It's kind of what happened with my mom's team this year. They're gonna be fine. Just keep your head above water. Keep playing. Keep getting better. Um, and then when when it's the end of the SEC. Uh, start, you know, peaking then, going into the SEC tournament, and, and you'll be where you want to be when it comes comes playoff time. But obviously, if you want to be hosting and things of that nature, you you got to be winning now. So um, just take it day day by day. Just take it game by game, pitch by pitch. Uh, they're super talented, and they just have to understand that there's a huge target on their back. Everybody wants to play them. Everywhere they go, it's going to be sold out. So uh, they'll be fine. They've got they've got too much talent. Uh, the cream always rises to the top, so I'm, I'm not worried about those guys. Kramer says he's not worried. Am I worried? I am not pressing the panic button because it's only the third weekend of conference play. But I think that one thing that Kramer mentioned there is, look, if you want to host, you got to start winning now. Because what you don't want to be faced with toward the end of the season when you're injured and exhausted You don't want to have to sweep your final two or three conference opponents because you got behind the eight ball after losing series to Mississippi State and Florida and, my goodness, I hope not Arkansas. I think that there's reason. there. I I can see both sides. Look, I'm concerned about the bullpen. I am. Because we've seen the bullpen blow leads. We saw it. Against Mississippi State, we saw it against Florida, and we saw the bullpen not really do a whole heck of a lot for you last night against Arkansas. But I'm not pressing the panic button because I think it's just too early. And I'm not pressing the panic button because I think I know what this team is capable of doing because of the talent on the roster and because of this coaching staff. Because I have that belief in Jay Johnson. Does this look like a team that's going to go to Omaha and get to the final and win the College World Series? No, it doesn't. And I know the goal is to get back to Omaha. I know the goal is not just to make the postseason, but to be competitive in the postseason and to get far into the postseason. Like hosting a Super Regional is what we want to be talking about here. It doesn't look like a team... This team at least isn't playing like a team that will be hosting a Super Regional come mid to late May. But I'm not pressing the panic button yet. You've got two games against Arkansas left. And Luke Holman, your ace, is on the mound tonight. You need to win this one tonight. You have to win this game tonight against Arkansas. Then you've got yourself a nice little rubber match on Saturday. This is a really good Arkansas team. But you're also a really good team. And starting SEC play, going 0-3 in your first three series, regardless of how difficult this schedule is, it's the SEC. Schedules are tough. Everyone's schedule is tough. You have to win this one tonight. For so many reasons. To keep your hopes alive of still winning this series. I think you need to win this series. And also because I think you need to win every game in which Luke Holman is on the mound. So you heard it from Kramer. And I'll take Kramer's word over mine or anyone else's. He's been there. He knows what that feeling is like. He said they're going to be fine. 
I think they're going to be okay too. I just need to see a little bit more progress. You know who else I have a whole ton of belief in? Who I am fired up about? Who I know is going to be just fine, or at least who I hope is going to be just fine. That's this LSU women's basketball team. They take on UCLA in the Sweet 16 on Saturday afternoon. Let's get into that coming up next after just a few words from our sponsors. All right, I want to tell you about Nissan. So this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. Every week, we're picking one team that stands out. It's a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Alabama Crimson Tide can only be described as a pathfinder. They have been so thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves, entering the tournament as one of the hottest teams in the country. After taking down North Carolina in the Sweet 16, which was such a good game on Thursday night, it's very rare that you watch a game that's like 35 to 40 full minutes of good basketball, but that's what we saw last night with uh, with Alabama and North Carolina. But they'll look to take... Uh, to battle Clemson to earn a trip to the Final Four for the first time in program history. Alabama, Clemson in the postseason. I think we've we've seen that one before. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. All right, rolling along here, Locked on LSU. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get into it. Sweet 16 time. Men's Sweet 16 started Thursday night. Women's Sweet 16 starts on Friday night. No, South Carolina uh, takes on. Who do they take on today? Why is that escaping me? Notre Dame? South Carolina plays on Friday. LSU takes on UCLA on Saturday afternoon, noon tip off uh, central time tomorrow against UCLA. This is going to be such a great matchup, such a fun matchup. And look, UC, uh, excuse me, LSU has their work cut out for them against this UCLA team. Pac-12 is an incredibly competitive conference on the women's side. I mean, look at USC. USC was a one seed. Colorado, who unfortunately we as LSU fans are very familiar with. Oregon State, top 15, the spot top 15 team in the country. Stanford, one of the best teams in the country. So this UCLA team, they're battle tested. Kiki Rice, one of the best players in the country. Lauren Betts, she leads the team in scoring, averaging about 15 points per game. This UCLA team. They're loaded, but you are too. A few things that I, that I want to touch on with this LSU team. They can't be hung up on that game against MTSU. You cannot be hung up on trailing at half. You can't be hung up on the comeback that you had in the second half, which LSU looks so much better in the second half than they did the first. They really turned it on. They found a way to win, and they didn't just find a way to win. They found a way to dominate in the second half, a team that really was working them for the most part in the first. It was a physical and chippy game. I got a feeling maybe a lot of these LSU women's basketball games are going to be physical and chippy. Can't stay hung up on that. Move on. Move on. The other thing is, like we all know, you know what the national conversation is about this LSU team. It's Kim Mulkey. It's the Washington Post article. She's made that a major headline. And whether you agree with that or not, that's that's not my point in the slightest. The point is, no one's talking about this matchup against UCLA. Everyone's talking about Kim Mulkey. Everyone's talking about, oh, when does this Washington Post article drop? Any minute now, we're all checking our computers. We're all checking our Twitters. Just checking to see, okay, when's the article going to drop? I don't think that this team is going to be distracted by that, frankly, because I think that Kim Mulkey is too good of a coach and too smart of a woman and a too smart of a coach to even make it a, a public issue if she did think that this was going to be a problem or, or be a distraction for this LSU team. Maybe it wasn't that first half against MTSU, but they figured something out in the second half. So that's what I, I, I don't want to happen is 
coming into this game, maybe with, you know, clouded vision of what's been happening. The other thing that this team cannot do is look ahead to what's next. I would love to see an LSU-Iowa rematch in the Elite Eight. I think the entire country would want to see an LSU-Iowa matchup in the Elite Eight. As much as I would rather have seen Iowa, LSU, South Carolina, and add, you know, USC or UConn into the mix, as much as I would love to see those four teams in the Final Four on the biggest stage in the tournament, I mean, Iowa, LSU, that is a serious and likely possibility in the Elite Eight. I think all of the TV networks probably want that to happen too. Because hello, Iowa, LSU, after all the drama of last season, the two biggest stars in the sport and Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark, how they made national news last year after the national championship game, a rematch in what is likely to be either Caitlin Clark or Angel Reese's final game in that uniform. I mean, we're all salivating over that. And let's be honest, they know that that's a possibility too. And all of them want that. They all want an opportunity to get another crack at Caitlin Clark and this IO team. They cannot be looking ahead to that. This UCLA team is not a team that you can look past. This game, the Sweet 16, when the stakes are as high as they are, you can't just say, okay, we just got to get this game behind us and then on, on to the, the big stage. Heard from Kramer right there. He was talking about baseball, you know, very, you know, on brand. Kramer, Kim Mulkey's son on the show. We heard Kramer saying, look, every team that LSU baseball faces is going to get their best shot. They're the reigning national champions and they have a target on their backs. I can apply that exact same logic to this LSU women's basketball team. And we've seen it all season long. Everyone gave this LSU team their best shot. Everyone wants to beat this team. Everyone wants to be the ones that put a fork in this team and end their season. You can't look ahead. And I'm not saying that they are. I'm not saying that they are because, again, Kim Mulkey's a smart woman. She's a smart coach and she's a good coach. And she's going to make sure that her team is focused and locked and loaded on UCLA because I was not a possibility if you lose to UCLA. So I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm just saying those are the things that I don't want to happen. But it's going to be a great game. It's going to be a great weekend of basketball on both the men's and the women's side. Hope everyone enjoys their weekend and has a very happy and safe Easter. That's going to do it for me today. Thank you for making Locked on LSU your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on tomorrow's edition of Locked on LSU. We all, I know I do and you do, we all have our expectations and our thoughts about this LSU football team at this point in the spring. But I brought in an outsider's perspective. Not an LSU fan but knows this LSU football team. What are his expectations for this LSU football team with the roster as currently constructed as of mid-March? We'll get into that on tomorrow's edition of Locked on LSU.